I appreciate all you coming. My name is Bill O'Brien, and they asked me to moderate this debate because a number of them saw me uh, over some time period function as the uh, Speaker of the House, and they realized whatever we do, we're going to look good in comparison. And so um, I was willing to take on that role. Uh, the, the, uh, the debate here is going to be done um, in, in a, sort of a quick pace. I'm going to ask uh, questions. We're going to direct them to one side or the other. We've asked that they keep the answers to two or three minutes, and there's going to be a one-minute uh, opportunity to rebut. We're going to try to do this in about an hour and a half. There's a lot of questions. But again, we're going to keep it somewhat fast-paced here, so because I would like it if we had a chance to have audience members be able to ask questions as well. Um, this, there's some ground rules, really simple ground rules, that we have uh, uh, requested here. And they sort of reflect a, a meeting that uh, I run along with uh, former Representative Steve Stepanek uh, twice a month. And, and that, those rules are basically no personal attacks, just keep the policy. Let's, let's try to make sure that this is a, a debate where folks are learning things and considering the issue. Because I imagine that there are some here that view this issue of the um, legalization, full legalization, and regulation of, of cannabis the way I do. I, I listen to one side say that has a lot of merit, and I listen to the other side, yeah, but that's kind of true too. So I'm, I'm still learning, and I, and I really do want to hear what the arguments are. <coughs> so uh, we have today with us, starting from uh, the far side of the uh, panel, um, Ross Conley. Ross Conley is the Deputy Speaker of Americans for Prosperity. Uh, he's born and raised in, in Hollis, New Hampshire, so he's a minority here in New Hampshire that actually was born here. Um, he graduated of Bishop Girton High School, and he currently uh, lives in Merrimack. Dr. Joe Hannon, a um, former colleague of mine, uh, served as a public member of the Marijuana Study Commission. Uh, he is a former state representative from the town of Lee, and a person uh, in, as he puts it, long-term recovery is that from work at all? Or? Substance use, but yeah, work and, and the legislature. Okay. okay. Yeah, we do have to recover from the legislature. Matt Simon is the uh, New England political director for the Marijuana Policy Project, a nonprofit organization dedicated to legalizing and regulating cannabis for adults. And uh, he lives here in, in Manchester. Neil Hubacher is the Director of Strategic Alliances for Cornerstone. Uh, he's spent nine years, was it, uh, as a uh, pastor in Beverly, Massachusetts, um, and let's see, mainly as a, I'm having trouble reading your, your uh, why don't you, you're not the only one. So uh, my main role is church engagement, just getting the church, inspiring them to, okay. to engage with what's going on in the concrete. Okay, great. Sorry about that. I'm sorry. And Representative Steve Pearson is from Derry's first term in the House. He's on uh, the Education uh, Executive Department's Administration Committee. Uh, he's also a lieutenant on the Manchester Fire Department in charge of uh, Safe Station Number 2 when on duty. And, and finally, uh, an another uh, former colleague of mine and still a current state rep is uh, Pam Abrami from Stratham. Stratham, rather, he's in his fourth term. Um, the fifth? fifth? Oh, yeah. yeah, I should be able to read. Um, <laughs> and he's assistant uh, Republican floor leader and was chair of the commission to study the legalization, <coughs> regulation, and taxation of marijuana. So with that uh, introduction, we're going to start with the group that is, I'm trying to remember who went across, uh, the proponents of um, legalization. I just want to say one more thing. Um, I, I'm, I tend not to be a politically correct person in any given way, and so if I say legalization or criminalization or decriminalization, I'm not prejudging the issue. That's just because I don't know how to talk about these things. So bear with me, and they'll correct us whenever we uh, when they correct me whenever I come up with the wrong word. So I turn it over to your team. Thank you very much, Bill. Wonderful to see you all this evening. This may be the most ideologically diverse audience I've ever seen in my life, which I think is really cool and reflective of this issue uh, in general. Um, I want to begin with the most overarching arguments in favor of legalizing, regulating, and taxing cannabis. And I think the biggest picture in one sentence 
is that cannabis is less harmful than alcohol, and most Granite Staters believe it's time to treat it that way. What we're saying is not that it's harmless, that it is less harmful. The harms that it does cause, we believe, can be much more sensibly addressed through a regulated system than through our current system of prohibition, which simply drives the entire issue underground. Uh, drug dealers, gangs, and cartels control the supply chain from seed to sale currently. And drug dealers have proven, I think, over a significant period of time that they don't care about protecting kids. Uh, we, we often hear you can't legalize because we got to protect kids. Well, Prohibition's done a terrible job of protecting kids. Kids have been saying for decades that it's very easy for them to obtain cannabis despite the best efforts of law enforcement, teachers, and parents over a long period of time. Public health has not been protected because drug dealers sell products that are untested and unregulated. A consumer doesn't know if that bag of cannabis is 5% or 25% THC, doesn't know if it's covered in mold and pesticides and heavy metals, might even be laced with other substances. Consumer has no way to know that in a regulated system the consumer would. Similarly, public safety has been undermined by prohibition much more than it has been helped. And we believe that much as with the historical failure of alcohol prohibition, <clears throat> cannabis prohibition has caused far more, far more harms for society than the use of cannabis itself. To the extent that cannabis does cause harms, we think that they should be addressed in a rational manner through a regulated system, through public education, through testing, independent testing and accurate labeling of products. And when two states did this in 2012, it all seemed like a grand, crazy experiment. Let's see how it goes. In 2014, retail sales began in Colorado and Washington. We now have nearly five years of data. Not only has the sky not fallen, uh, billions of dollars have been spent at retail, regulated, licensed retail stores that have created tens of thousands of jobs. And that is all money that would have gone to the illicit market. That's all money that would have gone to drug dealers. And instead it went to businesses that don't sell to kids, that don't introduce their customers to heroin or fentanyl or other drugs. So we simply see this as a bill that, one, expands personal freedom. My libertarian friends will love the fact that it allows home cultivation and will leave adults alone if they choose to use cannabis. At the same time, it changes the way government approaches cannabis. It's not an anarchist approach at all. It simply replaces an ineffective prohibition with a regulatory regime that we believe will have much better impacts. So I believe that's the pro case. Thank you. And now from the uh, opponents of legalization. Yes. Thank you, Bill, and it's good to be here. As my wife says, when are you gonna get done talking about marijuana? Because I've been at this for a year. I mean, Matt's been at it for 10 at least. 12. 12, there we go. So let's just talk about what, what, mar what are we talking about when we say marijuana? I mean, people have a vision of marijuana as 60s, 70s, and 80s, 3% <coughs> THC marijuana. That's not what we're talking about today. Since marijuana has been legalized, it, uh, big business has moved into the market. They hire botanists. They've been engineering the plants. The plants now range anywhere from 15, producing 15 to 30 uh, percent level of, of THC. It's a much more potent product today than some of the older folks in this room may remember if they ever used. And that's a big issue. Number 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 two surrounding that is that it it most people well a good percentage of the people do not smoke it. Smoking is passe. It's it's edibles, lotions, and all of that. And the other thing is that there is an, uh, vaping of of uh, of a product. Of, uh, they 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 ex extract THC from the plants to create waxes, and the waxes are put on needle nails and vape in a vaporizing uh, device, and it it, 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 vape, it produces a vapor that's inhaled. And, and some of these now are 94% THC, 94% THC. So to me, in any other world, that's a hard drug. So, so that's important to understand what we're talking about. We're not talking about a joint with, with, with a product with 3% THC in it. The second, the second point is that 
legalization means normalization in the eyes of adolescents. No matter how you look at it, mom and dad are doing it, the government saying it's legal. We just heard claims that it's, it's not going to increase, but just think about that a minute. So you're going to hear arguments about that from our side. And another argument you're going to hear is that why, why, why do it now when we're in the midst of the opioid crisis? Uh, and again, that's, that's, that's another argument you're going to hear. Uh, there is no roadside impairment testing. It isn't like companies haven't been trying. Believe me, they're trying because whoever comes up with this is going to make millions of dollars. And the problem is the THC stays in your system. Even urine tests doesn't mean you're impaired if, you, if you're test positive to it. So that's, that's a problem. Uh, it's still federally illegal. That means banking is going to become an issue in many states. It is a, it's, it's cash business uh, to be seen. But we had a, on the commission on the, uh, that I chaired, uh, we had someone from the banking commission who said that, that uh, New Hampshire banks will not touch this. And, and we will see what that means. So they mean, they mean taxes will be, be paid cash and it will be a, tax, a, a cash business. And uh, uh, I think one minute, thank you. Uh, addiction is really, we can't say that people don't get addicted to, you, you may hear tonight that people don't get addicted to marijuana. That's not true. We heard from plenty of testimony in the commission that uh, from, from counselors and, and people that work with with, with patients, yes, you can get addicted to marijuana, especially at these, these high levels of, of THC. Don't confuse the non-hallucinogenic CBD uh, compound in terms that, that mostly is used with, with medical uh, therapeutic uh, uh, programs with, with the hallucinogenic THC, which is uh, used more for the recreational side. And uh, just remember that the eight original states that, that legalized did not do it through their legislatures. Most legislatures have rejected this over time. Now, some are starting to uh, move forward with it. Okay. But, okay, let me just finish this one thought. Absolutely. And that it was, it, it was through referendum votes. New Hampshire, you're not allowed to have it. We don't, we don't do referendum votes. And uh, so, just understand that when Denver, when Denver, when Colorado passed theirs, the Hickenbacker, the governor then, the the, uh, uh, the legislature, a lot of the ranking members of the legislature didn't want this. But guess what? They the, it, it passed because the other side did a good job of marketing it to people, explaining what what you know the benefits where the other side wasn't debating it, and that opened it up, and the rest is history. Um, Again, all eight states that legalized originally were were two were friend of votes. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. One of the secrets of being the Speaker of the House is you get to make up the rules as you go along. <laughs> um, but, but, but here we're going to make up a rule. Um, I hadn't mentioned, if you run over your time, it's taken out of the next, next segment. Okay. Um, the, the next round of questions are um, basically come under the category of are you listening? And so I'm going to ask those, the group that's the three panel members who are against legalization, one of them will answer, uh, if you could provide a summary of the reasons you've heard for being for uh, legalization of marijuana. Just, just, I, I'm trying to figure out if you... Is that going to... You asked us to do opposites. Right. Yes. So you want me to go? All right, so I do. Okay, okay sure. So we yeah, get to go the back speaker, that's going to go on. So, well, we'll, we'll, start, Ross, we'll, I, 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 we'll start with the other side. We'll okay. Back back back. Right, that's fine. So as far as uh, reasons you have heard, reasons that we have heard for, uh, for being for the legalization of marijuana, uh, primarily the tax revenue money coming in can be used to help vets and folks in addiction recovery, where uh, 41 earmarks 11% of the revenue will be dedicated to addiction recovery. Another point, it will help people get off opioids, it is claimed by some that people will turn to marijuana to get off of opioids. Uh, retail products from specific sources will be predictable. Growers will be regulated as to what pesticides <coughs> they can put on their plants. Uh, the argument that you'll be able to track usage in the state as retail sales will certainly be trackable because they're taxed. Certainly, uh, as was done in their introduction, the, that alcohol is worse, so why not make pot legal? We already allow products containing alcohol to be sold, so 
so why not why not cannabis? And the final argument that you know we that we can uh, relate to as far as being for marijuana is that it will be strict, restricted to those over the age of 21 because it is claimed that this law will ensure that no one under 21 will have access to marijuana in any way. Okay, great. Any rebuttal? Right, we can. First of all, if I were to go by media articles on this, I would I would agree with what the previous speaker said, that the main point of this is tax revenue. Marijuana is bad, but if we could tax it enough, then we would make a lot of money, and that would be good and offset the bad. To the credit, I believe, of the sponsors of HB 481 and all of the, the major advocates for it, uh, tax revenue has not been the selling point of this bill. The selling point has been trying to take hundreds of millions of dollars out of the illicit market away from criminals and shift it into a legal, regulated market. Um, that's the main thing that I wanted to say. Anything else? Uh, as far as teen use, uh, you know, no one's claiming that teens won't have access to it. Right now, they have absolutely no problem getting it. Uh, there was one gentleman who spoke from uh, one of the coalitions against this who was saying that uh, if you want weed, go ask a youngster. Uh, I asked everybody who was opposed to this uh, in, in the commission that I got to ask the question of, you know, do kids have any trouble getting it now? And the answer was a resounding, oh, no, it's everywhere. So I don't see how this is going to increase teen use. We've seen the opposite happen in uh, a lot of the studies that have, that have occurred in other states. Okay, great. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to jump to the other side and ask you the mirror image of that question. You've, you've listened to the debate a long time. Uh, you're for legalization. What have you heard as the main reasons to oppose legalization? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I'm doing my best John Burt impression there. <laughs> a little slower. A little slower. <laughs> Sorry about the sound. There was a speaker behind me, but I'll try and project as much as possible. Um, so I think a, a lot of the, the arguments for keeping prohibition in place we just heard, um, so mainly that children are going to have easier access to uh, cannabis products uh, because of legalization that it's dangerous uh, to the public's health, and uh, people will drive while intoxicated on cannabis. That's a, that's a theme we hear uh, quite, a, quite often. Also that it's a gateway drug, that if you smoke cannabis, that the, the next exit off the highway is uh, fentanyl and heroin. And then uh, the last argument I've heard quite a bit is that the federal government will be able to seize your firearms. Uh, something that has, has kind of come up on the, on the Republican side. Okay. Any rebuttal on those being the main reasons from the other side? Okay. So as, as far as the, uh, the main point of the black market, you, you've got to really look at, at the realities of what's going on in the two specific states that have been legalized, California and Colorado. California alone has seen a substantial increase in their black market upon re legalization, not a reduction. Colorado is dealing with the fact now that the Mexican drug cartel has now moved into Colorado because it is such a lucrative business for them. Um, so the, the idea that the black market will be reduced is a theory that doesn't have any practical application, especially when it comes to New Hampshire in the sense that we do not have tracking once you purchase. So the concept of purchasing this, as soon as it leaves the retail store, it is non-trackable. This leaves the black market wide open to continue to sell because as soon as they make the transaction, the buyer doesn't have to worry about the risk of prosecution. As far as the, as far as the concept of it being a gateway drug, as someone who runs a safe station in the city of Manchester, I will tell you that we talk to everybody that comes in. 5,000 people have been helped here, and I will tell you for certain one of the most common elements with everybody that comes in the door is the fact that they started on marijuana. It's, it's, you can look at the studies all you want, we've done our own, and, and it's resounding. Do you ask about alcohol? So, about, about milk? We, we, we'll probably be able to get to some questions. We're going along pretty well, so we'll, we'll go to audience questions. So what I'm going to ask you to do now, those, those who are against um, legalization, is you've had an opportunity to rebut. Can you expand on um, your arguments as to the reasons you're for <coughs> doing it are wrong? Yeah, thanks, Bill. So I think um, when we think of 
the legalization, the commercialization as it's being presented in HB 481, um, one kind of resounding line that we are saying among ourselves is that um, this particular bill and this particular way, it privatizes the gains, but it socializes the losses. In other words, we don't agree, I'm sorry, we don't disagree with Mr. Simon who says, you know, hey, six billion dollars in Colorado, absolutely. But, you know, it's, it's, it's the business leaders, which is okay. It's the business leaders who are reaping the benefits of that, and, and that's fine. But it socializes the losses. So in other words, all the losses, there's economic loss, there's social loss, and it's going to be on the backs of the taxpayer to deal with all of that. So as far as three reasons, um, it's, one's been touched on already, just normalization. You know, our laws affect culture. Of course culture affects laws, but our laws affect culture. And has been said that culture, when it's normalized, what hasn't been brought up yet is the perception of harm. So for example, with tobacco or with alcohol, as the perception of harm is increased, use has decreased. But if we have retail pot shops in every corner, the messaging is that there's not a perception of harm. And we expect then for uh, use to increase. So it's the normalization that, you know, do we want to be this kind of drug culture? That's one of the first things. Because we're, you know, we're talking about the, this, this approach privatizes the gains, but it socializes the losses, and we'll have, to, we'll have to bear it. The second is, it's been addressed a little bit already, but the burden on on uh, law enforcement and the burden on health care. So the burden on law enforcement, like what we see in Colorado, is the increase in THC-related traffic fatalities. That's a big deal. We see that there's no sobriety field test for THC impairment, so nothing's holding up in court um, when it needs to. And we see, I, as one article quoted, a whopping increase in ER visits related to the ingestion of edibles, mainly. And so we just got to think, you know, these are social costs that will tr turn into financial costs for all of us. Is that what we want? We just want to think it through. And lastly, something that hasn't been addressed yet is, I mean, Mr. Simon actually referred to it as a regime, and that's exactly my concern, is that the creation of the Cannabis Control Commission, it absolutely is a regime. Um, statutorily, it looks a lot like what they've set up in Massachusetts, and I can tell you it's very expensive, right? They're asking for $2 million to start it up. We heard testimony last week from the Department of Revenue. It's going to cost another 400 k to, to collect those taxes. And um, the expense is one thing, but I think the, the thing that's more offensive is more the regulatory capture scenario of this commission. In other words, you look at the Cannabis Advisory Board, you've got 11 people on the board. Eight of them, I mean, the commissioner has to be, by, by statute, has to be pro-pot. I just can't think of a time where we've seen that much like thought control in a... Um, in, a, in, a, in a public position, like demanding that someone believe something, and if they ever show anything different, they can't be um, in that position. But the 11 members of the, um, the Cannabis Advisory Board, eight of them are pro-industry. Only three of them are going to come from law enforcement or public health or social justice. So let's not deceive ourselves. It's a corporate capture. It's a regulatory capture scenario. The interest of the CCC is big business. Great. We'll privatize those gains but the losses are, are all socialized. We've got to bear the burden for the startup. We've got to bear the burdens. Okay, thank you. And I will turn to the um, legalization uh, members in just one minute to rebut that, and then we'll turn to you for uh, the same question to you. Uh, I'll try to address all these in a minute if I can. Burdens on law enforcement. Uh, we're assuming that nobody is smoking cannabis now. So, uh, you know, we're kind of saying that, oh, if it's legalized, all of a sudden people are going to start smoking it. We've, got, we've had estimates of between one and 200 or more million dollars a year worth of cannabis already being <coughs> sold in New Hampshire on the illicit market. Uh, also, uh, as far as law enforcement, we know that the numbers actually go down. Uh, Border Patrol has actually had drastic decreases in the amount of marijuana that's been, uh, in, that's been imp impounded at the border. I believe the numbers were around 200 pounds per, per agent. Now it's around you know, a fraction of that. It's gone way down. I think it was a 70% decrease in, in interdictions. Um, that frees up time for other things. Uh, also, THC being uh, found in uh, traffic fatality victims in Colorado, uh, it, it actually has been found in people that have been involved in fatalities. But it does not mean that they were under the influence of, of cannabis. THC can be in your system for up to 30 days, so if you used it three weeks ago and you're in a fatality, you're positive for THC, oh look, it's a marijuana-related fatality. That's absolutely not a, a, a correlation there, uh, let alone a causation. Uh, ER visits. ER visits have gone up, but uh, they haven't really uh, gone up a very significant amount. I asked the person who was the medical con uh, person for the cannabis program there if they have a problem with uh, 
laundry detergent pot exposures, and actually the numbers for that are way higher than cannabis so, exposures. So that's one minute for we got over. Okay. But um, we do have a question for you, and you might want to just continue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. The, I can the question is, having listened to the top three reasons um, for opposing legalization, what is your reaction to them? I think we're getting some of it. Right. Okay, great. Um, well, I can start off by saying the number one reason is prohibition has been an absolute failure in every metric, every way possible. Uh, the goal of it was to decrease use, to make it rare, to have social stigma attached to it. It is obviously not the case and it hasn't worked. It definitely didn't work during alcohol prohibition. Uh, to address the point of uh, higher concentrations being available now, nothing raised the concentrations of alcohol higher than the prohibition years. Before that, alcohol was nowhere near as concentrated. And even today, you can go to the liquor store and buy grain alcohol. It doesn't mean you have to drink grain alcohol. Because there are higher concentrations, doesn't make it mandatory. Also, uh, if you're concerned about your Second Amendment rights, you don't have to smoke marijuana. It's not mandatory. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, as far as prohibition being a failure, this has created an absolutely horrible underground economy. Alcohol prohibition gave us Al Capone, and uh, you know, the rest of the and, and uh, prohibition gave us two things: gave us Capone and the Kennedys. So, you know, what we've seen is. Uh, the numbers of law enforcement officers that were killed per capita during Prohibition was extremely high. It hadn't reached those levels. It was near, I think, 300 a year. It didn't reach those levels again until we ramped up the war on drugs in the early 70s. And it's a direct correlation to how many officers get killed in the line of duty when they're enforcing these Prohibition laws. Uh, the other thing, a, a second point uh, about Prohibition um, and why it should be legalized is because it is a safer product. Uh, as far as it being a gateway drug, I do a lot of work with substance use treatment facilities. I'm someone who's in recovery for 26, 27 years myself. And I can tell you that as far as uh, the science on whether it's a gateway drug, it is very inconclusive. There is no uh, scientific evidence that says it is a gateway drug. But in the way I consider it a gateway drug, if you're buying from someone on the illicit market, you're more likely to buy something else from the illicit market from that individual. You know, someone in my position, as a teenager, I, you know, might, I might have purchased something. And I can tell you that I was very surprised to find it had something much stronger in it that I didn't know about. So this does create another safety issue. So uh, the safety factor, and also it's, it's an incredible, uh, the third point is it's an incredible uh, opportunity for reallocation of resources and saving our resources, which is a profoundly conservative principle. We believe in limited government, self-government. We don't believe that the government should be taking control of all of our lives and micromanaging them. If there are some negative consequences to behavior, that is up to the individual primarily. There are some uh, possible uh, risks associated with substance use. And as far as uh, how they affect the community at large, it affects it worse when those people can't get housing, they can't get a job, they can't um, get school loans, and they wind up being homeless. We actually make it harder for people to get better by having prohibition laws. So the, um, opponents of, uh, the opponents of legalization have one minute for rebuttal. Um, no, yeah, that's the next question is... Sort of we can go right to the next question if you want to. Uh, yeah, which is to... Uh, so the, the, the top three reasons that they mentioned why, how, how, why we well, sure. agree or disagree so, with their three points. But I was having trouble keeping track of what your three points were. Can you reiterate your top three points? Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, we can make it safer and reallocate resources and be more in line with conservative principles. Um, and yeah, it doesn't work. Yes. Basically, it doesn't work. You can break that down work. any way you like. <laughs> All right. so if you I will, I will I'll, I'll, I'll try to take a crack at this. Um, First off, I, I'll agree with you on one thing, and the one, one thing I, I drew from the, uh, uh, from the commission was that, yes, it will be safer for the user to know that they are buying from a, a store that, that uh, has testing, there's testing in the bill to test the product for contaminants and all that, and that it's not laced with fentanyl or whatever it might be. So I, I'll agree, I will concede to that point. Uh, that, that was one of the, the benefits that I walked away from being the chair of the commission. But, uh, you know, prohibition doesn't work is, I guess, the, 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 other, the, the other major point that you were, you were making. And 
alcohol alcohol has been around since the beginning of time. I guess marijuana has been around as well. But uh, and you know, but people people drink alcohol for many reasons. Okay, it's, they beer and wine. They like they like to taste the beer. They like the taste of wine. Uh, you don't necessarily drink those things to get high. From my perspective, <laughs> you don't. Some people don't. I mean, and there's, there's only one reason that people use marijuana or cannabis. They do. Now, don't, not again, let's not confuse medical cannabis with, with, with THC cannabis. There's a difference. Yes, there's claims of health benefits. And I've, I've come a long way in my thinking about the medical cannabis program because it's, it's turning out that there are some, some health benefits uh, through using the CD, uh, CD uh, extract. But, uh, but I, I think that's about all I want to say. Really. Okay, good, thanks. We're going to go to the next round of questions. Um, and I'll start with the uh, panel members who are for legalization. To what extent is your opposition to the criminalization of marijuana. To what extent is your position based on the high cost of enforcement of, of the uh, current law? Yeah, I mean, I, at AFP, this is obviously one of our very big sticking points. It's, it's the comparison between the perils of prohibition and the benefits of a positive outcome regulatory system like legalization like in HB uh, 481. So just getting down to how much does prohibition cost? Uh, there's a couple different levels of financial, how much does it cost? And then socially on people's lives, how much does it cost? So first, uh, since the beginning of the war on drugs, when, when we declared war on drugs roughly 40 years ago, the US government has spent $1 trillion and each year for the past decade, has spent around $51 billion per year adding to that. And then in 2014, over 1.5 million people were arrested for some sort of drug-related possession crime. Of that, 700,000 people were arrested for possession of cannabis. That is resources that we're taking away from going and fighting and trying to stop the flow of opiates and opioids in the state and in the country. So 700,000 is a significant portion of the amount of uh, resources that are going towards the war on drugs. Then in 2016, more people were arrested for possession of cannabis than all violent offenses uh, in the country combined. Um, yet the rate of use of cannabis in the United States is higher than any place in the world. So clearly it's not being a disincentive for people to go and smoke cannabis and possess cannabis, but we're spending an enormous amount of money on policing it. Then you go to the societal cost. What does an arrest for cannabis cost a person? 50,000 to 60,000 uh, students are denied financial aid every single year due to some sort of drug charge. A vast majority of those are a possession of marijuana, and a vast majority of those are also people that were around or over the age of 21. A conviction for cannabis leads to limited job opportunities. Is, there's a good chance that after you lose your financial aid and get kicked out of college, that you then have to seek uh, you try and seek employment where you have to get an occupational license. Most occupational licensors, uh, licenses, the board would look at it and possibly deny you for that charge on your record. So we are, the, the question is, what is the cost of taking someone that is a productive member of society, going to college, or, or running a business, and then setting, putting up a barrier in front of, in front of them, for the rest of their lives because they can, because of one charge for a, 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 a bag of cannabis. If you had one, one ounce of cannabis in the state of New Hampshire, this is what could happen to you. Thank you, Ross. So I'm going to ask the you know, folks that are for or against legalization, sort of the mirror image of that. I mean, obviously to us, 
now looking at it, you must think the current cost, uh, and monetary cost, and societal cost of enforcement is worth it. I'm going to ask you, is, is there a point at which those costs could become so high that you just say it's not worth it? But I, I just wanted, before we do that, I just wanted to one rebut on that. You know, a absolutely. absolutely. Uh, you, you know, we've, already, de we've already decriminalized this. I mean, a lot of the argument you just heard was about arresting for and being charged with and having a misdemeanor on your, on your record. We've, we've taken care of that in, in New Hampshire. We've decriminalized it a year or so ago, and that, that seems to, to be working. So I'll go to say that. And then okay, and then the question is you know, whether or not there's a point where costs could be come too great to make the effort work. Yeah, and I think that's a great question. And by the way, Ross, I really appreciate your command of the information, as well as I really enjoy your suit, by the way. Just jealous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's a great question, and I think that you know, the answer is maybe, um, but um, like Representative Abrami just shared, I mean, we've already decriminalized possession up to three quarters an ounce. So I think, you know, we've already taken the, the, the pressure valve has already been kind of um, released on that, I would, I think. Um, and who knows, you know, if we look at a, 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 um, a continuum, you know, a theoretical continuum, you know, on the one hand, there's absolute prohibition over here. On the other hand, we have like total deregulation. I'm not saying that um, we might need to keep swinging the pendulum, you know, a little bit more in, in, in a direction, but I feel like um, 481 is kind of this, it brings us in a third direction that is just, you know, a lot of government control of a bad idea. And so I just think we can do better on, on this particular one. But, I mean, to, to answer the question, I think maybe, but I think we've already passed it. You know, we, we've decriminalized up to three quarters of an ounce. Do we need to decriminalize an ounce? You know, an ounce and a half? Sure. I mean, maybe. Um, so. Okay, great. Thank you. Quick rebuttal, and then we'll go on to the next question. We already gained a quarter of an ounce to the rebuttal. Well, it's that's kind of going back and forth. That was actually oh, the well, answer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think in the terms of decriminalization, yes, that was a great step, but there is still a black market that exists that people still have to go to a drug dealer who sells other things, like we mentioned, that are completely, you don't know what you're buying, and that that is still a problem that exists, not to mention three quarters of an ounce. Like I said, if you have an ounce in these situations, that's exactly what happens to you. It doesn't solve the problem as, as fully as it needs to be. Real, real quick, during alcohol prohibition, uh, it was illegal to sell it, it was illegal to manufacture it, but it was not illegal to possess or consume it for individuals. So decriminalization doesn't even bring us as far as we were under prohibition of alcohol. Thank you. So the next round of question I'll start off with the um, opponents of, of full legalization is um, will the legalization and retail sale of marijuana increase injuries, highway injuries, workplace injuries? Do you see that as, as a necessary result? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So in this particular case, it's time to talk about some numbers. So in 2006, 3 million Americans reported using cannabis at least 300 times a year. By 2017, that number had nearly tripled to 8 million. One in five cannabis users use marijuana to that extent. These are people that are in the workplace and they certainly drive. In Colorado, marijuana-related traffic deaths increased 154% between 2006 and 2014. Colorado emergency room visits that were likely related to marijuana increased 77% from 2011 to 2014. Drug-related suspensions and expulsions increased 40% from the school years 2008 and 9 to 2013-14. And this is according to a September 2015 report by the Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Traffic Area, which is a collaboration of federal, state, and local drug enforcement agencies. In May of 2016, the American Automobile Association conducted an analysis of Washington's marijuana-related fatalities and found that around twice as many fatal crash-involved drivers had THC in their systems in 2014 compared with previous years. According to the Highway Loss Data Institute, a study showed that collisions in Colorado have gone up 16% since legalization. In a Denver Post study, fatal crashes in 2016 involved more drivers that were intoxicated by pot alone when compared to 2014. More specifically, 52% of drivers in 2014 had absolutely zero alcohol in their systems at the time, while that number grew to 69% in 2016. Looking at Colorado in 2018, car accidents involving impaired drivers cost the state nearly $84 million, 
the report shows. Driving under the influence court costs for those who tested positive for marijuana approached $19 million. And the treatment for cannabis use disorder set the state back another $31 million. Even more importantly, 139 people lost their lives in Colorado highways as a result of accidents caused by high drivers. Another 180 residents had their THCs in their systems when they committed suicide. So on the workplace side, this is a whole other animal. The problem with tracking workplace accidents and injuries is almost impossible in all cases because drug and alcohol impairment are classified together. To compound this problem, medical, medical marijuana is now protected, so tracking its effect in the workplace has become difficult, if not impossible. Clearly, any type of impairment, whether it be from alcohol or the effects of marijuana use, are a problem in the workplace. And compounding this issue is the fact that there's no definitive field test for marijuana. This puts employers in a difficult situation of enforcing workplace safety <coughs> and workers' rights. On top of this, the fact that marijuana is still federally illegal and therefore is still prohibited from workers with a CDL, for workers on government projects, or for workers in most governmental contracts. Employers have a fundamental responsibility to ensure workplace safety, and routine drug testing should be part of that policy. Yeah, thank you. So the, the same question to the um, proponents of legalization gives a chance for rebuttal as, as well as um, expand on it. So, Matt. Sure. So we heard a lot of very scary sounding statistics there. I've heard a lot of these statistics before. Uh, they're from the Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Report. Uh, this has come up an awful lot in this, in this debate. In every state where I've worked, uh, I can tell you in the Vermont legislature, they were really fascinated because they spent a whole week taking testimony on this issue and they had the author of the Rocky Mountain Haida report come in and speak and they also had testimony from the actual state regulators in Colorado. And it was remarkable to hear how different the federal government's information is from the state government's information. How can that be? Isn't the government supposed to tell us the truth? So a lot of people don't know this about Rocky Mountain Haida. They're actually required by law to oppose the legalization of cannabis or any other Schedule I substance. It's in their own 1998 Office of National Drug Control Reauthorization Act. The ONDCP is the drug czar's office that, that funds and coordinates with Haida. Uh, and they're required to ensure that no federal funds appropriated to the ONDCP shall be expended for any study or contract relating to the legalization of the substance listed in Schedule I and take such actions necessary to oppose any attempt to legalize the use of a substance in any form that's listed in Schedule I. So that's why you might be hearing some very misleading numbers, okay? And there are several good articles that describe the methodology of these reports, of how they cherry pick information and deliberately present it out of context to you. Uh, that term marijuana-related traffic fatality is a good example. So prior to legalization, they weren't uniformly testing everybody who died in a car accident. After legalization, they started testing very uniformly and every coroner's office started reporting. So you would expect the numbers to go up. It's sort of like if you send one person fishing in Lake Massabesic and they catch 10 fish, and then you send five people out fishing and you catch 50 fish, you shouldn't be surprised because you got five more poles in the water. Uh, Read three more pages, you'll see a little footnote that says marijuana related doesn't mean what we suggested it did in the scary sounding graph. But I would, I would put it to you that these federally sourced statistics are a big part of the problem, and a big part of the reason that so many of us in state legislatures are talking past each other and believing different numbers. I believe the states that aren't required to lie to us by their own uh, law. So obviously public safety, you know, when, when Colorado legalized, some people said the sky will fall, teen use will skyrocket. Uh, it'll be bad for business. We heard that a lot. Definitely didn't turn out to be bad for business. Um, you know, in March 2017, the U.S. News and World Report ranked Colorado as the best state economy, number one. Um, and loss costs uh, related to workers' comp and, and uh, workplace injuries and fatalities, which is one thing we can track, actually decreased somewhat in 2015 and 2016. Um, so 
The fears have not been realized on that front to the extent that these things are problems. Prohibition isn't helping solve them. What can help with impaired driving is really two things. One is better public education. Instead of encouraging people not to drive drunk, you encourage them to not drive while impaired by any substance. Fatalities are up everywhere. It's frightening. Why are they up? Number one reason that experts will tell you is distracted driving, cell phones. Number one by far among substances is alcohol. Far and away the most problematic drug relative to driving. We sell it in roadside stores here in this state. Prescription drugs are a big creeper in this character, in this category. And we don't have a roadside test for those over, but they're widely used and associated with a lot of impairment. So, and that's, that's your time there. Sure. Okay, and um, we'll give the other side a, just a, a quick uh, minute for rebuttal if you want, and then we'll turn to the next question. So I'm gonna point out that uh, in, in what I just said was not solely related to the Rocky Mountain study. I also quoted the American Automobile Association, the Denver Post, and a state study in Colorado. Now as far as impairment and driving, you've heard a lot about the alcohol. They always bring up alcohol. But you've got to remember something. We are not trading alcohol for marijuana. Nobody's talking about making alcohol prohibited. So what we're doing is we're compounding a problem on top of an already existing problem with alcohol. So let me make that clear because the, the, the pro-legalization folks touch on alcohol a ton. These are very separate issues. They have maybe somewhat of a similar causation, but we're not trading. Thank you. So we're gonna to go to the next question and I'm gonna uh, turn to the proponents of legalization. And ask this, uh, start off with this question. Are there adverse effects from the long-term use of marijuana? And if so, why shouldn't those effects preclude further legalization? Thank you. No, we're actually going to Tony. No, they're going to so, Yeah, go okay. to your side first. Um, Just trying to bounce it back and forth as evil as I can. The research, um, there's actually no convincing evidence that even heavy long-term marijuana usage by adults permanently impairs memory or other cognitive functions. Uh, there are some studies that say it does, and there are some studies that say it doesn't. There's been a recent study that came out and said that uh, you know once you stop using it for 72 hours or longer, you're pretty much back to baseline. So as far as long-term effects in adult use, uh, it's either inconclusive or there is no evidence whatsoever. Uh, there are some uh, health consequences. People can have wheezing, coughing, um, you know, there's no direct link to cancer yet, but we do need more research. I'm not saying that, you know, anything's, nothing's possible, but nothing we have so far is even uh, leaning in that direction. As far as long-term uh, use for young adults and heavier users, there can be uh, incidents of people being more likely, according to some studies, of having a higher incidence of substance use disorder later in life if they start very young. And this is not just for cannabis, this is for anything, nicotine, caffeine, you name it. Uh, but none of the studies have actually proven causation. They, there's a correlation. If you use it younger, you're more likely, but that doesn't mean that's what caused it. Some people that have substance use disorder may have been predisposed or more likely to have started using earlier anyway. Um, you know, so, you know, the, when someone asked earlier that, you know, is it a gateway drug, you know, I drank milk first. That doesn't mean that milk is a gateway to heroin use. Or I didn't hear one, but I, it's you know so that's that's one aspect. Uh, the other thing is uh, for long-term health consequences, uh, it's a, there's a positive. No one's overdosed from it. Nobody. Um, you know they can say that it caused death in some other weird way. That you know if they used it three weeks earlier and they crashed, then that was a marijuana-related death. But that's that's not true. Uh, that doesn't mean that they were inebriated at the time. Uh, those uh, those numbers don't support the data in any real way. Um, I'm trying to think what else. That's three minutes. There we go. That's chance, good. You have a chance for rebuttal. I'm going to turn to the uh, opponents of, of legalization and ask you sort of the mirror image of that. If, is, is there adverse effects and why are they so severe, if you believe this is the case, to preclude full legalization and retail sale? Thank you. There are, in fact, studies showing adverse effects from long term use, but you have to go to Europe to find them. In the United States, universities won't touch the research as the study involves an illegal drug, so there's very little money for conducting this type of research. 
Under normal circumstances, any medical drug would have to go through a normal medical trial to determine risks and benefits. We all know the story, or a lot of us know the story, of thalidomide, a mild sleeping pill that was rushed to market in Europe in the 1960s. Over 10,000 children were born with deformed limbs as a result. After that was discovered, the process of drug testing was refined and strictly enforced in the U.S. and abroad, with one exception, marijuana. Marijuana was approved for use in its medical form without the normal testing procedures and trials that other drugs would be held to. What has been studied is marijuana's link to schizophrenia, and the results are alarming. A plethora of peer-reviewed research in top medical journals shows that marijuana can cause or worsen severe mental illness. In 2017, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine said quite clearly that cannabis use leads to an increased risk for the development of schizophrenia and other psychosis. And the higher the use, the higher the risk. Teenagers are three times more likely to develop schizophrenia with heavy marijuana use. Regular use shows an increase in the risk of developing social anxiety disorder. Finland and Denmark have studied cannabis since 2000 and have found significant increases in psychosis. The Schizophrenia Bulletin published a study that showed 27% of people with schizophrenia had been diagnosed with cannabis use disorder in their lives. In 2012, a paper in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence examined 9,000 adolescents and found that marijuana use was associated with doubling, doubling the domestic violence rate. Why this sudden increase in these problems? After all, people have been smoking pot mainstream since the 60s. The main reason is potency. 60s era's pot was 1% THC, while today's pot's 25 to 30, and with dabs and waxes as high as 85 and 90. As a result of insufficient clinical trials in the U.S. and the data combined from studies in Europe, it's clear that when you combine the adverse effects already known on youth brain development and the absolute link to schizophrenia and other mental disorders, the full legalization and retail sale of marijuana should not be permitted. Thank you. And quick First, I'd like to respond to the, the idea that cannabis has not been studied. It's true that the types of studies that would get it approved as a medicine have not been allowed to take place in this country. However, that does not mean it hasn't been studied. It's actually been studied to death. Uh, when Dr. Sanjay Gupta started researching this issue deeply a few years ago, he reported that he'd been misled by the first several studies he'd read because when he did an overview of the research, he found out that 93% of the studies done in the U.S. had been looking for harms, and only a few had been looking for benefits, and that, that presented a really distorted picture. But I want to paraphrase something that one of the doctors who testified in support of this, of this bill in the House said. He said, no, we haven't done the kind of testing that would get it approved as medicine, but what we have done is millions and millions of people have consumed cannabis over long periods of time. And those people have been studied. And the National Academy of Sciences review is, is hundreds of pages of an overview of those studies. And while it does plainly identify a correlation between cannabis use and the development of schizophrenia, it absolutely doesn't say that it's causation. And the actual members of that committee have publicly spoken out since this book has been written by a spy novelist named Alex Berenson. It's called Tell Your Children which is also the original title of the film Reefer Madness, for those of you who are historians. Uh, but I, I think it's really right up there with it, frankly. Uh, you know, the, there's a clear association, but people who have schizophrenia have a much higher rate than the general population of substance abuse, substance use disorder generally. They smoke far more cigarettes than the rest of the population, and they self-medicate with cannabis. Okay, we're going to turn to another perspective on this, and I'm going to turn to the opponents of legalization. Um, I think it's part of the general knowledge that there's substantial adverse health effects from long-term or the intensive use of alcohol. Um, would you support putting the same prohibitions on the use and possession of alcohol as you would, would for marijuana? Yeah, I think another great question, um, but I think that it is a false equivalency. You know, you're trying to make an equivalency with marijuana and alcohol, and that's what we, you know, we keep hearing that <clears throat> the prohibition word, which is just kind of a loaded term. Um, and I would say, you know, we have thousands of years, and just to, to give a little bit of counterpoint to what Mr. Simon has said, you know, we have thousands of years of people using alcohol and understanding its effects. 
We also, um, so I'm going to talk about, I guess there's data, um, uh, data potency, and um, a third point I'll make. So data, way more data on alcohol. And so, um, whereas marijuana use, we still need data on its effects. So that's, that's one concern, because what I'm trying to say is that there, there's just a false equivalency here. You know, I can have a couple of drinks in a certain amount of time and still be safe to drive. So I'm just, now I'm talking about potency. But the potency, you know, as has, was addressed by both Representative Abrami and um, Pearson, the potency is just a whole different ballgame here. And so um, that, that, that's why this is not an equivalency when we talk about alcohol and marijuana. Um, and then last thing, I, I'd say, I feel like the question's a little bit of red herring, and this is referring to something that Mr. Uh, Representative Pearson already said, and that, you know, we're not talking about, um, like, why compound the problem? In other words, I will agree, of course, alcohol is a major issue, you know, and just even looking at the CDC, uh, top uh, causes of death, I mean, number two or three is accidents, and then we'd have to drill down to see how many of those are alcohol-related. Um, but um, I think it's a, it's a little bit of a red herring, because why compound the problem? In other words, if we're already agreeing that alcohol is an issue, we're just going to throw marijuana on top of it without further study? It just it just doesn't seem wise. Okay, thank you. The question I have for this, I think, is somewhat different, so I'll give you one minute for rebuttal. Yeah, I just, quickly, I think we're operating under the assumption saying that we don't have enough data on marijuana, we don't know what it does, we're under the assumption that nobody in, on planet Earth smokes cannabis or uses cannabis. And the fact of the matter is that's not true. When we look at alcohol, the effects are clear. You can get cirrhosis of the liver. There's a, one of, it's one of the highest causes of death in the United States. And also the addiction rate of its users of alcohol is 15%, while the addiction rate of the users of cannabis is 9%. I don't know if you want to. Yes, thank you. Actually, you have 30 seconds more. I'm just going to jump into the next question, but since okay. it's relevant, roll it all together. Um, so we know a lot about alcohol. Well, you have 30 uh, seconds, and I'll ask the question so they know it. Just sure, sure, sure. <laughs> well, we know a lot about alcohol. According to the CDC, uh, six Americans every day die from alcohol poisoning, just the short-term effects of too much drinking in one sitting. Um, tens of thousands die from the long-term health effects. So we definitely know about alcohol, but I think we also accept that it caused even more harm when it was prohibited and left to Al Capone and others. So if cannabis is extremely harmful, why wouldn't we want it to be regulated to mitigate the harms? And I'll yield. Okay, thank you. And I have a related question and then the other for the um, uh, uh, proponents of legalization, and then the opponents will have a chance to rebut. And the question is, um, would you decriminalize any other drugs, recreational drugs that are now illegal to own or possess or use in addition to marijuana? If you would, why? If you wouldn't, why not? That is a challenging question, Mr. Speaker. I have a number of friends in, in the audience here who identify as libertarians. I think a couple of them might be anarchists, and I think they want me to ask the question, what legitimacy does government have intruding into the private life of any adult in New Hampshire? So having asked that in a roundabout way, I will now, <laughs> I will now point you can out that... that question, too. Well, look, I think that as it becomes clear, and this is coming from somebody who grew up in the 80s, they cracked an egg in a skillet, they said, this is your brain on drugs, any questions? And then they cut to black and didn't stand to stick around to answer my questions. I had questions, all right? It wasn't until a long time later that I started getting answers to those questions, and certainly one thing that I've concluded is that the war on drugs has been a tremendously unsuccessful public policy certainly as it was designed. It was supposed to create a drug-free America. We used to have that slogan everywhere and on everything. So all I would say on this question is that as if it becomes clear at some point that other drug policy reforms that are currently considered unthinkable have better results for public health and safety than prohibition, then we owe it to ourselves to consider those seriously. Joe? Real, real briefly, uh, we had the 18th Amendment that was uh, necessary to prohibit alcohol. 
Uh, I think it would be good to repeal the amendment that made all the other drugs illegal, and then we could just solve this whole thing. But I, I oh no, there was no other amendment. They only had to do it for alcohol and nothing else. So, you know, the question could be: Is there even the authority for the federal government to be doing this at all? No, there Thank you. Okay, and uh, the other side has a chance for rebuttal. I'm not a libertarian, but I am a Republican. So here's where, here's where I'm going to go with that. As far as the idea of, of government interfering w with individuals, I agree. Government should be very limited in the scope of, to which it interferes with an individual. But the problem is these individuals are now interfering with me. They're not interfering with themselves because these people leave their homes. Okay, so when, they're, when their rights to do whatever they want infringe on my rights to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, that does become a problem. And therefore, regulation does, is justified in that regard. Thank you. So the next round of questions will start off with the um, whole components of legalization. The question is, should the purpose of taxing marijuana sales be to raise revenue or to deal with the effects of legalization and retail sales? Uh, make this pretty brief because I think we pretty much agree on this. Um, you know, throughout the study commission, uh, we realized that a lot of other states made the mistake of taxing it very highly, thinking that there would be this big windfall of money. Uh, I don't think the people that seriously studied on this on either side of the issue think that that's the wise thing to do if you're trying to, to decrease the black market, if you're trying to uh, make it more um, you know, accessible and easy to get that is in a, in a regulated market that that's necessary to have some uh, taxation. I know some people would like to have no taxes whatsoever. I don't think that's a feasible option considering that, uh, you know, it's not going to happen unless there are, for one. And uh, secondly, that uh, the, the makeup of the taxes that are in the, the bill are, are pretty well rounded. I, coming from someone who works in prevention and treatment recovery areas, I'd love to see more of that money spent there, but it's much more than we currently spend from uh, the previous alcohol fund, which is only 5% of alcohol sales going to that. This is a much higher number for that. So um, I, I don't think we disagree. Okay. Well, same question to the other side. Yeah. Raise revenue or deal with the effects? <clears throat> yeah, well, you, Joe, you're, you're correct. Joe was on the commission with me. So, yeah, the commission said we should not legalize recreational marijuana for the revenue, meaning to fund other things with it. But there should be enough revenue to, we should have enough tax to cover the cost of regulation, the cost of, of any public services required to deal with it, as well as for addiction prevention and treatment. So those were the things. Now, uh, and I, I think we agree. Uh, and we, and the other, the other theme is that we should keep the tax low enough to try to uh, get the black market out of the system. And that's, and all states try to do that, but some better than others. Uh, when we talked to California, uh, uh, the commission interviewed all the eight states that have legalized. We Skyped them in for the most part. And California said, don't do it the way we did it. Please, don't do it the way we did it. They're, not a, they're a local controlled state, meaning that, that various counties and other municipalities can tax at will whatever they want to tax. When marijuana was, came forth, each county put its tax on top of the state tax, and it, it was all over the place. Now, in California, there are 80 assemblymen. In New Hampshire, little New Hampshire, we have 400 of us. There, there's 80 assemblymen. And all, as you know, all politics is local. And to try to get the state legislature to to rein that in is very difficult, and that and that's what we heard from uh, from from California, and, and that's a problem. We won't have that problem here because we're not really a local control state. The uh, speaking of addiction, tobacco tax. Uh, you know, I also call it the tobacco tax, the hypocrisy tax. Everybody says let's increase the tax on on to prevent smoking, and then as soon as people stop smoking, the revenue goes down, and everybody goes, oh, it's me, we, we lost that revenue. The same thing can happen with marijuana, by the way, that, uh, that, that we're gonna tax it, but as soon as we tax it, who, who gets addicted to the revenue is the legislature, okay? And so it's good that we start low, and let me just, right now in the bill 41, uh, the tax, 
um, we in the commission we said we gave them a range of if you tax it at the if you tax it at the uh, grower level it would be a per ounce tax uh, if you tax it at the retail level it would be a percentage tax uh, easier to collect at the at the at the wholesale or the grower level for DRA less there would be less growers than there would be retail stores retail is more flexible the market it's 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 driven by whether the price goes up and down in the market and the, the actual because it's good the way this is structured it's going to be free market and the, the price of marijuana is going to be set by the market in the state so uh, we, we just had a uh, work session Matt you were there uh, today there's going to be a subcommittee on this looking at what the best way is to uh, finalize what how we're going to handle this okay. we'll have a question about HB 481 so okay. if we can turn to the next question and uh, the question does go to the opponents of, of legalization and it is will legalization and retail sale increase or decrease marijuana use uh, generally, and then uh, on behalf of more younger people. By the way, will younger people be using it, or more people be using marijuana? Yeah, I want to just share a story um, from the city of Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, July 2017, um, you know, Massachusetts cre you know, created the CCC, and now communities there have the chance to opt in, opt out. In July 2017, now we can argue that the city of Lawrence is one of the largest or uh, most um, largest traffic as far as um, drug distribution in New England. But that city council in July 2017 voted unanimously to not have pot shops in their town, in their city. Why is that? Why would that be? Why would those city councilors decide that retail pot shops were not the best idea for them? I would think that it was because the very concern that this question raises, right? That youth, and yeah, so yeah, exactly. Youth and gang members, exactly. Concern for youth. And I think this question actually represents well, our biggest concern. Nothing to do with marijuana. Can you please? Go well, please. well, so I, I mean, on that, let me we're just share. Gonna, we're not going to have audience panel today. Well, I, well, I, we'll hopefully we'll get to some questions. Uh, well, so I mean, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I just happened, to, I'm telling a true story here. I happened to be in Colorado and over the President's Day weekend, actually visiting some friends. And um, I ran into a former state senator and I asked him, you know, hey, we're talking about this. What is the biggest unintended consequence that you, that the state of Colorado saw? And he said, just hands down, he said, the black market burgeoning in a way that we never thought. And again, my question is about youth. And so, you know, where are youth going to buy it? Are youth, obviously they can't buy it at a retail store, so they're going to buy it off the black market, which is now burgeoning. And it's burgeoning because he explained it this way. He explained that, you know, the drug mules, they want to make, they want to make money in both directions. So they're going to take the good pot that's coming from Colorado, they're headed down to Mexico, they sell it there, but on their way back, they come up with bad fentanyl, bad opiates. And so he's just saying that whole black market just exploded. Anyways, and I just wanted to make sure and, and be able to share that story. But yeah, as far as concern for the youth, I mean, absolutely. We have, we have testimonies from Colorado, Washington teachers that students are coming to school so high they can't even have a conversation, let alone actually be engaged in learning. And not a month goes by where we don't hear about middle school or high school youth who've ingested edibles. You know, just last spring, it was on Cape Cod. It's unclear whether it was knowingly or unknowingly. You know, we hear from um, the other side that, you know, packaging will be controlled, and that's great. But the thing is, youth, you know, middle school and high school students are still ingesting it. They're getting sent to the ER. You know, we just, in, in, the, in the fall, it was a story out of Florida. And so there's a great concern for youth. No matter how much we regulate the packaging and whatnot, there's a, there's a, a deep concern for youth. Again, you know, this, this plan, it privatizes the gains, it socializes the losses. We're all going to be paying medical bills for the youth. We're going to be dealing with the social losses. Thank you. Okay, we're going to, I'm going to turn to the uh, other side of the same question. You have a chance to rebut what you've heard as well. But the question is, um, will the legalization retail sale increase sales generally, use generally, uh, and specifically among children? No. Um, I'll, I'll expand on that. Um, there's... <laughs> There's been quite a few studies that have looked at uh, the teen use rates in, in uh, many of the early legalization states, and to the surprise of many of the people doing the research, it, the, it didn't show an increase in, in any major way, in any significant way. In fact, uh, usage actually went down in some of the younger teenage groups. Amongst high school seniors, you could say it's pretty much steady, you know, give or take uh, within the margin of error, but with younger, uh, younger teens, the numbers have dropped uh, significantly. 
In Washington State, uh, they looked at eighth graders in 2010, it was about 9.5% used in the past 30 days. 2016, it was 6.4%. Twelfth graders was 26.3%, and it went up a whopping one-tenth of a percent uh, six years later. So not a big difference. They can say it went up in seniors, but we're talking one-tenth of a percent. Uh, but it dropped significantly, almost by a, a third in uh, eighth graders. And tenth graders, it dropped from 20% to 17.2%. Uh, those numbers are pretty much the same you see in Colorado. Um, you know, there it went from all combined, 9th through 12th grade, it went from 22% in uh, the year before legalization, and now it is 19.4%, so it dropped over 2.6% uh, in uh, the teen use in Colorado. So there are not more kids that are using it. There are actually less if you look at the, the real numbers that are out there. Uh, one thing that I, I don't disagree with, there is a concern that teens think that it is actually safer than it used to be. Now, that leads us to think that there will be more kids doing it because they believe that it's safer. But the data shows that that's not the case. Now, can we do something about educating children? Because I'm, none of us up here are, pro, are proponents of uh, you know, teen usage and, and young adult usage like that. So there is a lot that can be done in that, uh, in that area. Similar to what we did with tobacco, with alcohol, I mean, uh, with uh, tobacco and smoking. You know, we were able to do a lot with, uh, without increasing any major draconian laws with tobacco, and we decreased teen use by an incredible amount in my lifetime. I, I remember seeing uh, ashtrays in the pediatrician's office when I was a kid. And we don't see that anymore. So that was and rebuttal, John. That, that was rebuttal. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and so the, the next question goes to the um, proponents of, of legalization. And the question is, if, if we do pass a bill, should it have a sunset provision so we can automatically revisit whether or not we've made a mistake? A sunset pr provision would be an absolutely terrible idea. If, if we are to legalize, say, pass HB 481, and it becomes law, the last thing you would want to do is have a, a, a sense of uncertainty for the community members who are going to be taking a significant risk in this, investing their money into opening up a retail shop and then have that hanging over their head to say, in five years, we, this may be illegal and you may be breaking the law again. Also, off of that, the one thing we know without a doubt is that the promises that have been, that have been made by the federal government, by our governments for decades and decades, is that prohibition is an absolute failure. It has not delivered on the promises that, that, they've, uh, that they've put forth. So should we go back to failure or should we try and improve a system that has more positive outcomes for people in society? I think we should move towards the positive, not towards, not backwards. Um, and I'll just leave with the, Einstein's definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I think that we should move away from the insane and we should move towards a, a system that, is, that has more positive outcomes for each individual. Okay, thank you. Same question to the opponents. Sunset provision? Uh, again, this is another one I think we agree on. Uh, no, no on sunset provision, uh, especially if it passes. Obviously, I'm, I'm against, but once it, if it does pass and, and passes through the governor and it's signed, then I, I'm concerned about the business owners. Uh, as we said, I am a Republican too, and I really do support the business owners. So to say we're going to sunset it and have a provision in there, to be that, again, there will be a certain a, a level of uncertainty from a business perspective that it is not fair to the people who are going to risk money and whatever to invest in these uh, establishments. And uh, the uh, and in general, I'm just not a fan of sunset provisions in legislation. So now, the, 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 why, and believe me, if, if this goes off the track, we won't need a sunset provision. The, the, legislation will, the legislature will act and, and correct. But that's why it's so important that the bill that's in front of us is done right and it, we get it right the first time on this, on this issue. So, and remember that, as I said earlier, one last point is that if, even if we had a 10 to 10 year sunset in this thing, that, that by that point, the legislature would be so addicted to this revenue, it'd never get sunset. Right. No. Thank you, it doesn't seem like there needs to be a rebuttal then. So the last question before we turn to the audience, um, House Bill 
481 was reported out of the first committee. It's gone to a second committee. Reported out of the first committee without any changes from uh, its original draft. Um, it leads to a, a question as to whether there might be substantial flaws in it. Um, and so I turn first to the opponents of legalization and tell us what you think. Okay. Well, it's in. Uh, it came over to Ways and Means. I'm I'm, I'm a Ways and Means <coughs> member, um, and we had a hearing, a pretty long hearing last week on this, and we had a uh, work session today. <clears throat> and I have four four areas that that basically relay revolve around. Uh, well, in, in general, I'll, I'll tell you the ones that relate to revenue. Uh, in the bill, there's no opt-in provision. There's only an opt-out provision. Uh, most things we do in the state are opt-in, like Kino was opt-in, lottery was opt-in, where a town has to take an affirmative step and then go to its voters and say, we want to opt into having a marijuana business, whether it's a retailer or a grower or a manufacturer <coughs> in the town. It's, there seems to be an opt-out provision, which is different than an opt-in provision, in that a town could be asleep at the switch and Next thing you know, you have a, a marijuana store in your plaza. <coughs> and then, the, then the people in the town go, well, how'd that happen? So that's, that's the first thing. I think the, I think the bill needs an opt-in provision. There's, uh, one thing we talked about today, and Matt was there, uh, 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 there's no seed to sale tracking. Most states have seed to sale tracking in the bills. Uh, and the reason for that, and matter of fact, in the, in the Marijuana Commission, when we talked about this, it was really the revenue people who were really more concerned about having this from the standpoint of we want to make sure there's no diversion <coughs> from a grower to to the black market. You know, I'll say everybody's honest, but you never know. Would seed to sale tracking that would be caught and um, and no no uh, so seed to sale and, and that is something that that is ways and means it will be taking up. Um, and the other, the other reason other states told us about seed to sale is that since it's still illegal federally, that the uh, th this is a way to say that the federal government, staff or back, we're really regulating this tightly. So just understand that. And, and seed to sale means going from all the, the supply chain from seed to sale. The third, the third thing is um, the bill does say no smoking of marijuana in public places. And I like first. I like to see that strengthened. Say, make sure it says in uh, public, uh, outdoor places as well as indoor places. Uh, but it mentions nothing about vaping. Uh, so, I think we need to talk about vaping, both both the <coughs> vaping, you know, the jewel devices and all that, which you can get marijuana for those kind of things. But also the the vaping I was describing earlier with the dabbing and all of that. We just don't want somebody out there dabbing in public. But the bill doesn't address that, that I could see. And then the fourth and final thing, uh, the way the money is allocated, uh, and, and this is something else that the revenue, uh, that Ways and Means is going to take up. Uh, the, the initial pass, when the money comes in, it's going to go to the regulation of it. Then 50000 a month is going to go to... Uh, uh, data collection. We talked about data collection earlier. Uh, data fifty thousand every every six months, and then the rest gets allocated different uh, in percentages. And twenty percent is supposed to go to municipalities that have retail stores, and thirteen percent is supposed to go to municipalities that uh, have grow sites or manufacturing sites. And I have a problem with this because this is breaking new ground for New Hampshire. All of our taxes usually get allocated back proportionally to all towns, whether they have a whether they have a, a, a liquor store in it, or whether they have a, a, you know a kino store in it, or a kino being sold in it, or lottery tickets being sold in it. So this is this is something that I I'm nervous about because people people in the state doesn't matter your town may not have a marijuana store, but people are certainly going to be buying it from the store, the town next to it. So why are we sending money to just the towns that have stores and, and all that? So this is something that Ways and Means will be taking up, and there may or may not be a amendment. We'll see next week. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, same question to the proponents. So House Bill 481, I think, is overall a very good bill. I think the, the biggest 
issue with it is the narrative surrounding it. Uh, some people in the legislature see it as a liberal Democrat bill. I've heard it called that. Uh, it's actually a very bipartisan bill, and it's a bill that's based really almost entirely on the recommendations of the study commission. Uh, I certainly disagree with Representative Abrami on this issue, but when he was wearing his commissioner's hat and scheduling really good testimony from eight states that had experience with this, and when the commissioners were asking good questions and learning a lot and producing a very detailed report, I have a lot of praise for that report, and I think it was very useful to the, the people who put the bill together. Um, there are certainly a few issues that might be addressed by, by ways and means. Um, the opt-in versus opt-out is something that speaks directly to the issue of do we really want to eliminate the illicit market or not? That was the biggest challenge in Colorado was initially there were only a small number of towns that approved retail sales. And our opponents love that because you can't eliminate the illicit market when you've only got stores in a few towns and people have to drive three hours to get to one. So we heard all these stats about how we haven't illicitly eliminated the illicit market. Flash forward to today, uh, there was a study, uh, a report commissioned by the State of Colorado Department of Revenue, Marijuana Enforcement Division, published last year. And it said after four years of regulated sales, uh, the illicit market for resident and visitor marijuana has been largely, if not entirely, absorbed into the legal market where it is regulated and taxed for the protection of public health and safety. And I can hear the disagreements, and so there, let's talk about it. There is illicit market activity in Colorado. To some people, marijuana is legal in Colorado was a reason, if you're a criminally minded individual, oh, I'll just go buy a house in Colorado and grow it full of cannabis. Nobody will notice. It's, it's legal there and I can ship it to New Hampshire, where I can sell it for 400 bucks an ounce, rather than the 200 bucks you can buy it for in one of our stores. That's the illicit market activity that's happening in Colorado. It's not retail stores, or the, the illicit market, oh, we'll just cut our prices in half so we can compete with this handy retail store. The illicit market has changed, and it's primarily an export market. It's supplying the 50 states that refuse to allow a legal supply. So, We'll debate the tax issues. Some people want to go to a percentage tax instead of 30 bucks an ounce. Ways and means will have it out on that Friday, but I'm confident that whatever they do come out with, it will be a reasonable tax rate that's lower than what we see in, in neighboring states, at least somewhat lower, not higher. Thank you. We're going to close with three minute closing statements for each side, but before we do that, we have some additional time. Does anybody have any questions? And I would like them to be questions on a statement of your position on this issue. <laughs> but something that will draw out information later. Go ahead. Thank you. Hey, uh, I'll just say this. I don't it's support it at all. Support. I think we're going down. It's got to be a question then. Really. Right. 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 The question is, is this. Yeah. You legalize it in the state of New Hampshire, right? The slippery slope being this, that they're saying you're going to legalize it. People can smoke in marijuana. What about young men and women who are in our military or who fly planes or even drive NASCARs? Are we going to allow them to smoke also? And, and who do you want to answer that? Any of them. Do they drink alcohol? Oh, wait. Uh, uh, I suggest it might be two different answers. Uh, they, they can't uh, drink alcohol while they're flying or driving or any of that stuff. Um, and, you know, just because it's legal doesn't mean you have to do it. It's not required. Uh, the other thing in Canada, they've recently legalized it, and their law enforcement officers are actually allowed to smoke cannabis in their off hours as long as they do it so many hours before they report mm -hmm. to duty. So, you know, some of these laws, there are laws in place that prohibit uh, the misuse of not just cannabis, but any, um, any substance that could potentially cause harm in, a, in like a, you know, someone with a commercial driver's license or an airline pilot. This would not give them in any way permission to, to fly, drive, or, or use while, while doing those jobs. Okay, quick, follow quick, up question, follow up question. So let, let me have a quick rebuttal here. Just a follow up. Quick rebuttal. I assume, I, wait, I wait, wait a second, that. Randy. We'll, we'll have that. I'll get to you. Okay. Just, uh, I just have a quick rebuttal. Okay. Yeah, they don't. Follow up sure. And I expected your answer, believe it or not. Okay. Because You're smart we, guy. Because <laughs> we know that marijuana stays in your body for 30 days. All right. As a former truck driver, uh -huh. all right, if I go down and get a drug test and I find positive, I'm done. Yeah. I'll never drive again. Right. Get another job. You know, exactly. You'll get another job. That's the way it goes. That's, right. That's, right. That's what happens. That's right. Too bad. You're going to legalize it and you'll open the door for other things to 
Well, no. It's just no like the legislature, Andy. What's your question? That was it. <laughs> what are you going to do when someone is as same thing that happens to you if you drink alcohol and you get up? I'll answer the, the right. question that I thought. Uh, uh, okay. I'm, I'm, since okay. it's addressed to me, I'd like to real briefly. It's going to be the exact same thing if that person was do, was using a prescription drug prescribed by their doctor, if they were using alcohol from the store. If they're not allowed to have it for their job and it's in their system, it'll be treated exactly the same as that. Now, if you're concerned about it, don't do it. Oh, I don't. Okay. Good. Yeah. Great. Yeah, Problem solved. Don't make other people do what you want. The, the fact is simple. The, the federal prohibition is not going away right now. So if you have a federal driver's license, as I do, and as that gentleman does, it doesn't matter what New Hampshire does. Plain and simple. Fine. Okay. Yeah, That's the way it goes. Mm -hmm. question. Go so as an individual who uses marijuana, I have a question for um, those opposed. And I really appreciate your being here because I, I know this may not be an, an easy situation for you. Um, those of us who choose to use and for whom um, this is an important part of our lives and we're just not going to give it up on deeply personal reasons and therefore might not give it up for the same reasons that some individuals might not give up their firearms even if they became illegal or might not give up certain uh, religious paraphernalia even if they were to become illegal as they are in many countries around the world. Um, I have a question. Are there any things that you do in the privacy of your own home that your neighbors might find extremely disagreeable, might even consider dangerous, even though you're not personally endangering them? And to what degree are you willing to defend your life, liberty, and property against those in government or not who would use violence to take those things from you? And would you expect those of us who are being persecuted to act any different? What's it take then? Well, you're 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 you, you don't have to reveal personal issues. No, <laughs> you, well, that's fine. You, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you I'll give you a couple things here. First of all, you're combining some things that, that are fundamental things in the Bill of Rights with things that are not, and those are not comparable. The Ninth Amendment. The Ninth okay? Amendment. Absolutely. They're not comparable. And secondly, Absolutely. the Ninth Amendment does not give you a free open reign to do whatever you want whenever you want. It, it does not. Like yes, it does. So, so it we, does. I'm not here to debate the Ninth Amendment, okay? But you are. But you just you just tied in the Second Amendment with other things, and there's there's no comparison. Secondly, when you talk about your own home, your I have a single family home, but I used to live in a townhouse, okay? And we have an issue right now where the rights of a homeowner in a townhouse are being violated or obstructed or interfered with by an adjacent homeowner that smokes marijuana. They don't want to smell it, they don't want their kids exposed to it, and they don't want to deal with it. Property so, rights are so, still valid. Okay, except that in this particular case, you're talking about one person's property rights as an owner of a townhouse versus another. No, I'm not. You brought that up. So, I, I, no, 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 you asked me about interfering in, in my home with my neighbor. That is my neighbor, if it's an adjacent townhouse. So there is, a, there is a sense that you do have a responsibility beyond your own walls. But the real question okay, is important for society. I'm going to take one more question Would you defend here. yourself against those coming to take the I'm going to take one more question here. Okay. The gentleman here has a question. If you're asking if I would defend certain things over others, I have things that, I, that are fundamental rights that I think are defensible, and then you have things, as, as they have said, that you choose to do that you don't have to. Okay. You don't have to be Christian. Since I have to ask a question and I can't pontificate, please. Um, I'm going to let the other side, my schizophrenic side, ask this question. <laughs> so you are going to fix it. Uh, and you, <laughs> Stop it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned the fact that we've had alcohol around for thousands of years. You may already be aware of the fact that marijuana only exists because it's in effect been brought along with human evolution over the thousands of years. Do you know why it's illegal in the United States and when that happened? I'm gonna let I'm gonna leave that to you guys. I know, you know, do you know? When it became illegal and why? Nineteen teens? But why? Who, who was it and why? Is this important? It shows you how difficult inertia is to turn around. It it became prohibited on a whim, so Minnesota, and now it's taken us a hundred years to get rid of it. Go ahead. I think opium caused 
some very significant problems all over the world that led to a, a major awakening a long time ago. It's called the Opium Wars, I think. Thank you, audience. Uh, to, to, the, to your question, uh, the Federal Marijuana Tax Act was actually passed in 1937, uh, several years after alcohol prohibition uh, was repealed. So there were a number of factors that led up to that perfect storm that, that made it possible to pass the Marijuana Tax Act. One was that you had a bunch of out of work alcohol prohibitionists who needed something else to do with their time. Uh, I'm Harry Anslinger, who was the, the drug czar from the early 30s to until Kennedy got rid of him in the 60s, uh, was an undersecretary of alcohol prohibition before he was the drug czar. Uh, but there were other factors as well. There was William Randolph Hearst, who owned dozens of newspapers and also had vast timber holdings and did not want competition from hemp paper that was going to be made into newsprint. You had DuPont that uh, was close to having nylon ready to roll. They didn't want competition from hemp rope. So a lot of this added Wasn't up there to... Wasn't there also a, 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 a racial here. component? An and there was certainly a racial component. <laughs> <laughs> it was known as cannabis, the scientific term, for a very long time. And in the 20s and 30s, it became called marijuana and associated with Mexican immigrants for reasons that I, I think we can read between the lines and figure out. Thank you. Uh, is there a rebuttal? I'll turn to the left. I just, I just want to, it's a good uh, quote from the, uh, Har uh, Harry Anslinger, who was the guy we were talking about, the head of the Prohibition uh, Group. His, his reasoning, the primary reason to outlaw marijuana is its effects on the degenerate races. Most marijuana smokers are Negroes, Hispanics, jazz musicians, and entertainers. Their satanic music is driven by marijuana, and marijuana smoking by white women makes them want to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and others. It is a drug that causes insanity, criminality, and death, the most violent causing drug in the history of mankind. <laughs> right on, brother. <laughs> I've read that as well. And that's a great little story. But the idea that marijuana was made illegal because it was going to compete with people making paper is a red herring. What? It's no. absolute red herring. Absolute red herring. They already recognized... Can you stop a second? One of the things okay. I insist we must do is okay. listen to people and not show I'm people. listening. There's places that they do that sort of thing. We don't do it here. They've already, they recognized in the early 1900s the negative effects of marijuana on people. It was not about making paper. Okay, that, one, that's just nuts. One, one last question and then we'll go to the No, I, I actually yeah, yeah. already said Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentlemen, I'm going to ask you a simple question. Yes or no answer? Let me preface that with, I'm a Vietnam veteran. Mm -hmm. I've been there. Would you be willing to stand shoulder to shoulder with somebody in a trench that has a fully automatic M16 and is higher than a kite? Yes or no? No, I don't see how it's relevant. Though. No, but we can talk about the high percentage of people who use No, I wouldn't be in that trench to begin with. Thank you. Okay, great, great. So why don't we turn to closing arguments and uh, remind me who's first. I think was, you guys go first. There you go. So you guys go first. Okay. So, in closing, I said at the beginning that cannabis is less harmful than alcohol, and the most granite staters believe it's time to treat it that way. Representative Abrami noted that we do not live in a referendum state. Of course we don't. We all know that if we could put this on the ballot, it would pass. The last poll, the last two polls have shown that 68% of Granite Staters support legalization, including 56% of Republicans, and that 80% in the last poll from two weeks ago support having it sold in licensed retail stores and taxed if it is legal. That includes 73% of Republicans that support having it be sold in licensed retail stores and taxed. This matches the national Gallup poll that says 66% of Americans support legalization. Do we make laws solely based on poll numbers? Of course we don't. At the same time, we have a state constitution that tells us that our laws are supposed to be based on consent. Remember that line from the Declaration of Independence, consent of the governed? This is a policy that the public does not consent to. We're asking law enforcement to enforce laws that two-thirds of the people who live in our state object to. 
for that reason alone, we should lean very strongly in favor of doing this. And if the prohibitionists can't prove to us that the sky will fall, which I would argue they have not done, we should go ahead and do it. Why would we want to do it during an opioid crisis, an addiction crisis? What better time to take money and power away from drug dealers, away from gangs and cartels? We've been trying to fight this war with the criminal justice system for decades. We've destroyed countless families. We've ripped communities apart. We've spent billions on a law enforcement and criminal justice approach that hasn't worked and that has only made matters worse. If we want to reduce harms, this is the way to go. Let's end prohibition. Thank you. Here this evening, you've seen just a taste of the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to the legalization of marijuana. Proponents point to the past as an argument that marijuana is a harmless, non-addictive drug. But today's cannabis is not your father's marijuana. Today's drug is a refined, genetically altered, super form of pot, not from the days of the hippie, but from big, the labs of big marijuana. If you don't think big marijuana is a thing, then look to see why companies like Philip Morris and other tobacco giants are getting into the business. You see, legalization endorses the creation of a drug culture, a culture sanctioned by the state, a culture that will not respect the age restrictions found in this law, a culture that has no plans to stop with marijuana. This drug will be used by our youth in increasing volume. Any school administrator in a state where marijuana has already become legal will tell you of the increased problems with the dropout rates and the failing grades. This is what happens when someone becomes enveloped in a drug culture. We are not going to solve our drug crisis by legalizing more drugs. That's a fundamentally flawed argument. The war on drugs is not going away. Legalization of cannabis is not going to slow the war down in any way. The war will continue on class one drugs, and so there'll be no savings there. Legalization creates far more problems than it's worth. An idea that proponents argue with untested theories, unrealistic revenue projections, and a disregard for real consequences. Legalization privatizes all the gains and socializes all the losses. A social cost that sees a rise in the black market, a targeted socioeconomic class of lower income and minority citizens, and a devastating impact on the mental health crisis that already plagues us. Never before has there been such a separation between science and public opinion due largely to intentional marketing and misrepresentation by the pro-marijuana movement. It's time for New Hampshire to take a stand and say no to a movement that has no desire to make New Hampshire a better place to live, but one that focuses endorsing reckless behavior and profits. Thank you. This is a tough issue. It's competing perspectives of personal freedom and a vision of what a healthy society is. And so I really re do respect these panel members for having shown mm -hmm. such courtesy to each other. I respect this audience. I very much respect your ability to listen and contribute as well. Thank you. There's a bunch of food back there. It has to be to get back in.